if you're going to go and live in a country on the other side of the world, you need a network to help you meet yeah. people, yeah. to get your visa. You know, there's just all sorts of stuff that has to happen. How do you get the money out there? It's getting easier these days than it used to be, but in terms of logistics and wise allocation and good use of people, mission agencies so provide an enabler, that network. Really. Yeah, 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 a catalyst. And- Hello and welcome to Independence, the FIEC podcast. Thank you for joining us today. My name's Adrian Reynolds. I'm the head of National Ministries for the FIEC. That's a fellowship of independent evangelical churches. And I'm joined today uh, by Eddie Arthur. Um, hello, Eddie. Hello nice, again. Nice to see you. And thanks for coming and joining us again. Um, Eddie, you are... Well, how would you describe yourself? Just give us kind of a couple of um, a couple of adjectives. Um I, well, I'm a missionary, but I, I'm basically my my role is to try and make people think about what mission looks like in the 21st century. Great. Well, thank you, and thanks for coming to FIC Towers here to come and talk to us a little bit about mission. Such an important subject, of course, for church yeah. leaders to engage with. What, what's your mission story? How did you get into to mission yourself, Eddie? Okay, I'm not going to sort of tell that story, but um, let me tell you about a guy called Twelly Bay Laurent. In 1958, the first mission, Twelly Bay Laurent is a Kuya. Uh, the Kuya people live in the rainforest and Ivory Coast. And in 1958, the first missionaries came to the Kuya area, preached the good news of Jesus, and the Kuya people chased them away. They wanted nothing to do with this foreign stuff, apart from Twelly Bay Laurent, who became a Christian. And for the next, that was 1958, the next Kuya to be converted was 1981. Goodness. So for all that time, he was the only Kuya believer. But he would get on his bike and he would go from village to village in market day and preach the gospel. But he had a very limited understanding of the gospel. And basically all he would say is, you've got to turn to Jesus because Jesus is coming back. And he would just say this in various yep. ways. And as you've probably noticed, Jesus hasn't come back yet. And so he became known as Laurent the Liar. You can Laurent. <laughs> and, but Laurent realised that, you know, he realised that he'd encountered Jesus. His life had changed but that he didn't know as much as he needed to. And one of the reasons was he couldn't read the Bible in his own language. So from 1958, he started praying, and he tells me he prayed every day for someone to come and translate the Bible, live in his village and translate the Bible into his language. In 1988, 30 years later, my wife and I turned up in his village to start translating the Bible. I was born in 1958. For every day of my life... Laurent prayed for me. Didn't know me by name. Mm. Prayed that I would, you know, prayed that someone would come and translate the scriptures. So, you know, when I was um, 14 and became a Christian, 16 and became a Christian, he was praying for me. When I was 18 and I discovered beer and Led Zeppelin and girls and drifted away from the Lord, Laurent was praying for me. When um, I met Sue, who spoke French and I felt a call to French speaking world, Laurent was praying for me. How did I get into mission work? Because a guy in Ivory Coast yep. was yep. praying for me. Now, what's quite interesting about this story, I mean, it's an extraordinary token of grace that you know that story. Yeah, it is. But actually, presumably, every mission worker, there is a story like that behind every mission worker. It's just that most mission, mission workers don't know the story. Yeah. and, and But I there think, is a story like that yeah. behind every every person who's sent. Yeah, and I think be, behind every um, Christian worker, you know, some folks know there was that aunt or that, you know, old lady in my church who prayed for me, and what even great, though I was rebellious. What, what a great encouragement that is. And it, it just makes me want to ask you a question, which we hadn't planned to ask. I'm going to ask you it anyway. Yeah. Um, let's talk about church life and mission praying. Because we've we actually, in previous episodes, we've talked about a little bit about sending missionaries. We've talked about missionary strategy. We haven't talked much about the prayer mm-hmm. meeting. How does a church pray well for mission? I think by being informed, right? Um, you know, share information, get, you know, go somewhere, you know, wh- whatever the source, whatever it is you're interested about, find out about it and pray intelligently. Um, and then look for, answer, you know, it's, it's the same, it's the same. How do you encourage congregations to pray about anything? You have an interest, you have information, and then you show what the Lord's doing. So don't, you know, don't just pray. Lord, do this, but then go look in Francis and see yeah, how he intervenes. Yeah. Great. 
Now, we're going to talk about mission agencies today. Yeah. Um, now, you've got a vested interest in this subject. I, you, I have, yes. You work with and you've led a, a mission agency. Yeah, I've, I work with Wycliffe Bible Translators and Great. I was for a while the CEO. Okay, and you've, you've written about mission agencies, sometimes somewhat provocatively, it has to be said. Um, so, kouya.net, <laughs> yeah. K-O-U-Y-A.net. Um, some very interesting articles there about mission and mission agencies. So w- what we want to do really in this episode is, is both affirm the place of the, of the mission agency when it's working well, mm-hmm. but also gently and, and friendly critique some of the things that we see in, in mission agencies and think about how church leaders can engage well with mission agencies. Yeah. So, so why are mission agencies a good thing for stars? Well, take, take the example of the agency I work with, um, Wycliffe. If a church wants to be involved in Bible translation, they have a couple, they want to send them to do Bible translation. I don't know of any church in the UK that would have the skills and the background to train that person, to send them to a place to provide the the background, to have access to the you know the best computer software, uh, a network of contacts, and all of the stuff you need. Mission agencies can provide a massive amount of logistic help to get things done. You know, if you're going to go and live in a country on the other side of the world, you need a network to help you meet yeah, people, yeah. to get your visa. You know, there's just all sorts of stuff that has to happen. How do you get the money out there? It's getting easier these days than it used to be. But in terms of logistics and wise allocation and good use of people, mission agencies so provide an enabler, that network. Really. Yeah, 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 a catalyst. And, and presumably, if you're a, a smaller church, you haven't got someone to send out, but the Lord has really given you a heart for Bible translation. Um, actually, a mission agency is a great way to engage with with a topic, with a subject. Yeah, exactly. You know, or if you're interested in a particular area in the world, the, you know, specific agencies work in different places, do different things. It's a way of getting keyed into what God's doing. Yeah, but mission agencies are not churches, of course. That's right. Yeah. And, but you might be forgiven when you look over the history of mission agencies for saying that some agencies. We're not going to name names, but some agencies <laughs> perhaps have, have got a bit beyond themselves. In some ways, is, is that a valid criticism? Yes, I, I think I think so. I think um, it's one of the things we said in one of the earlier um, episodes is that we get our ecclesiology of um, of mission wrong. Um, the church is God's primary structure for equipping and making disciples, yeah. and that needs to say the same to stay like that. Mi- mission agencies have their place, um, but. We need to centre things on the life of the church and on what the church is doing. And what are some of the traps that mission agencies fall into commonly then that that we should be on the lookout for as church leaders? Well, I think that there are a number of red flags. Um, One is if, um, if a mission agency is willing to take somebody on and send them overseas and keeps their home church right in the background, doesn't talk to the church early on, you know, where is this young person being formed in Christian life, formed for Christian service? It's within the church. Yeah. And sent from. And sent from, yeah. you know. If if the if the mission agency is not talking to the people who know them, you've got to ask some questions. But equally, I think, um, you know, it, it's easy to say, well, mission agencies should be doing that. Churches fall into the same trap. Um, you know, there's a... Um, sort of cynical way of looking at it. The churches um, pray, pay, and go away. They right, they just yes. delegate yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. they just leave so, the mission so agencies to be clear. To, with. to be clear, that the fault is not entirely with mission yeah, agencies. Yeah. It's that churches neglected their responsibilities. Yes, yeah. you know, we uh, churches feel that you know, as long as they've they've sent sent somebody to an agency, they they send the check along every month. They pray for them when they get the prayer letter. That's their all done. Um, and I I think just across the board, we need to rethink how those relationships work and what you know it it's specifically the case when you're looking at sending one of your own members to work as a missionary through an agency what is the role of the church the role of the church is to disciple to encourage to discipline that doesn't change just because somebody is somewhere else how how does that work when you're collaborating effectively with other churches to send someone. So you, you might be a, a smaller church that's that sent a missionary, but actually you don't have the, the resources, the money especially, yeah. and so other churches are supporting them. So other, other churches feel like they've got a piece of the action, if you like. Yeah. 
Is there still a pro- always a primary sending church in those circumstances, do you think? I would argue so. Yeah. Um, you know, I, th- I think, you know, the, the answer to your question is you've got to talk. Yes, um, yeah. We get into all sorts of messes when there are multiple churches supporting mm. a missionary. Um, missionaries will often play churches off against each other. Um, I, I had the case of someone who... Um, had gone through a particular traumatic time on the field. They came home for a while. They desperately wanted to get back, but both Wycliffe and their home church, one of their home churches, said that you know they needed time. They yep. needed yep. recovery time before they went back. They didn't want to take the recovery time. They just shifted their allegiance to another church, left Wycliffe, and went back on their own bat. Okay. That sort of thing can happen. So actually. Partnership between churches. I mean, it's not, it's not unlike what the FIC is trying to foster yeah. more generally with the church planting and other initiatives in the UK. That sort of partnership between churches, where one church takes the lead and other churches say, we're not we're not actually supporting Bob and Jane. Yeah. We're supporting you to send Bob and Jane. It becomes yes. a church partnership, doesn't it? Rather than a rather than just a lots of people chipping into yeah. an individual. That's how I would see it. And actually, yeah. um, it's something I think FIC might, think about doing how do they facilitate you know a, a church wants to send one of their members they don't have the finance now typically the way we work that is the church says well we'll send you um go off and raise the rest of your support yeah, yeah. which i don't think is appropriate i think if a church is saying we'll send you the church has to be a partner in raising that support right, right. and i think the best way to do that is through partnerships with other yeah, churches yeah. and you know could FI and actually help as a, that? As a church leader, so here I am in um, bottom end of Leicestershire, but actually, and I'm you know often getting you know things through the post or yeah. people phoning up or saying you know can we come and do a presentation at church about a mission agency? But actually, it's much more powerful, isn't it, for another church leader locally to phone me up and say, Adrian, we're sending so and so. Um, in fact, it has happened to us, yeah. not not in terms of world mission, but to a cross-cultural role in Leicester. Mm-hmm. We're sending so-and-so to this place. Will you partner with us yeah. in sending them? Actually, that's a more powerful connection, isn't it? And better for the missionary as and, well, I think. It's much better for the missionary. It, it, it means lines of responsibility, lines of, you know, discipleship and accountability are clear. Um, you know, we are supported by one church. We're sent out by that, but we have other churches who because we've gone to them, support us. Yeah, yeah. So what is our responsibility to there? You know, it, it gets very, the whole accountability thing gets very messy. Yeah, yeah. Um, are we just being too idealistic though? No, I don't think we are. I think I think we need to rethink it. You know, I've, I've said this, yeah. I think in the other two times we're here, we need to rethink our ecclesiology hmm. of, of mission. And let that drive yeah. what we do. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think being driven by good theological principles is never too idealistic. Yeah. Um, but it does mean there needs to be really good communication. Um, you know, when you've got numerous churches, an agency and a missionary involved, lines of communication and spending time talking are really important. You know, if everything's going well, it doesn't really matter. You know, the missionary's thriving. There are millions of converts Everything's happening. Um, sends back the prayer letters. Everything's encouraging. Yeah. Comes back on furlough. Goes around the churches. Speaks to people. That's grand. But when there are problems, if you don't have clear lines of accountability, clear lines of responsibility, it gets much messier. Um, you know, and missionaries do have problems. They do have moral laps, as the term is within my agency. You know, and presumably all the things that we see in. UK churches, it's not just yeah. the moral lapses, relationship breakdown or trust yeah. breakdown, mm-hmm. poor health, you know, all yeah. the sorts of things we might see amongst church leaders are also going to be the same things that are challenges for, for missionaries. Yeah, I'd, I, I'd say yes, and probably more so. Yeah, because they're we, working in a different environment. Yeah, the, yeah okay. and, you know, they may be very isolated, yeah. so mental health issues get exaggerated. Um, this sort of negative behaviours that happen when you are stressed, can come to the surface. Um, And so I I think, you know, you need to plan, you know, expect the best and plan for the worst. But that means that, you know, when churches and agencies are working together, you need to know who is responsible for what. Mm. And 
Um, you know, it sounds awfully negative to talk about it, but I would say that church disi- the discipline of Christians rests with churches. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, if you understand discipline in its broadest sense, which is a form of, you know, discipling yeah. both positively and negatively, yes, I yeah. think that must be right. So, you know, the, the agency knows what's happening on the field, but in the end, if there, if there is a big problem, they have to say, okay, you know, church, your member is doing this, you know, how, how, you know, how can we help you deal with it? But it's church's issue. Um, which probably churches don't want, but <laughs> no, I mean, it just it, it it could be just another burden, yeah. couldn't it, it? Yeah, yeah. But actually, you would care for other. And we talked before about how missionaries ought perhaps to be church workers, seeing yeah. that light. You would care for other church workers in that same way. So why not care for yes, a, yeah. a mission worker mm-hmm. in the same way? Um, tell us a little bit about how a church can have a have a constructive relationship with an agency. I mean, obviously, you're not going to. Um, you know, you, you don't want to be um, phoning up the agency and saying, I think you're doing this wrong and this approach is wrong and, and what have you. Um, they're, they're very useful. We've talked about that, mm-hmm. how they're, they're useful in terms of serving and able to do certain things. So, so what does a constructive relationship with an agency look like? I, I think from the start, setting up what are the expectations. And would an agency expect you to do that, speaking as an agency kind of guy? The good ones would. Yeah. Okay. And in fact, if they don't, think twice about then it. Then you've got questions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But... Um, Knowing and agreeing who has what role is so important. You know, you shouldn't need to be phoning up the agency to find out what's happening with your member because you've talked about how you'll get information flow already. Yeah. Um, And I think a lot of that then involves spending time, you know, if you're sending your missionary through an agency, going out to visit the missionary, talking to them, talking to their field leadership, getting, you know, because the personnel officer in the UK may may not have much of an idea of what right. the person right. is doing in Kazakhstan yeah. or wherever yeah. they are. Yeah. So getting to know the people they are working with, mm. um, I think that is really important. So church leaders really should be should be budgeting time, energy, money to actually go and spending time with mission partners they've sent. I I would say so. Again, yeah. that I think that should be seen as part of the budget for mission. Yes. Yeah. Um, and included in your costs yeah. of sending the person. And presumably most uh, people who have been sent as mission workers value that kind of input, don't they? Oh, they love man, seeing yeah. people. And yeah, yeah. yeah. It, makes yeah. Such a, it makes such a difference. So when it, did that happen to you when you were in the, in the Ivory Coast? Did people come out to see you? People did, but our church never, ever sent anyone. Okay. Now, you know, we were there in the 80s and 90s where that sort of travel was less than it is yeah, now. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, less easy to and do. phone calls home were a bit of a... A bit of a burden. Yeah. It took us yeah. four days to let my mother know she was a grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> so just to sort of slightly aside, because we were just touching on it in terms of trips, how, how do short-term mission trips fit into a church's strategy in terms of thinking about supporting individuals or sending individuals? Do they have a part to play? Because I've, I've kind of heard mixed things about them. They, they, they can be, you know, a massive thing. Um, church is really committed to short-term mission trips. And then I've also heard how they're just, they, they achieve nothing apart from solving the conscience, essentially. Yeah. It's, I, it's probably somewhere in the middle, I'm guessing. Yeah, I, I, like everything. It, I think there are, there are different ways you can look at short-term mission trips. One of the problems is they've become something of a rite of passage. Right. Every, it's the gap year equivalent. Yeah. Every, every Christian gap year person goes and does yeah. a... Short-term mission trip, and it is expected. I think that sort of thing isn't isn't really valid. There has to be a reason for doing it. If you as a church are going to invest in sending somebody overseas, there has to be a reason. Now, I would argue there is no such thing as short-term mission. I think there can be short-term exposure to mission. I think there is a value in young people visiting sure. mission work yep. or visiting Christians in other parts of the world and learning from them. Um, So, you know, I think I'm not knocking that. I think going alongside and working with mission partners from your church is massive. And actually the two of the highlights of our time living in an African village were um, two young women who came out, uh, one from our church and one from um, another church that we know, who came out and spent time looking after our kids and helping my wife be freed up to learn the language and to get more involved in translation. Um, that was huge. And, you know, I I would not knock short-term mission, but it has to have a purpose. Um, and it is at its best when it's keyed into long-term mission. Right. Um, right. So some sort of 
long-term involvement, however that works. I think the other thing we have to avoid is um, that it's basically just a holiday. Um, I did some research on this and um, based on a, a book that's um, a secular book on looking at the sort of volunteer industry and looking at, you know, is is international volunteering tourism or is it really something useful? And I looked at um, uh, the Christian sector in the UK in the light of that book. And most agencies who are offering short-term mission do have a genuine mission component. Yeah. But some of them were tourist agencies. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, if somebody wants to go on holiday on Thailand in their gap year, that's great. Go and enjoy Thailand. Pay for it yourself. <laughs> you know, do, do you think don't that, ask your church to pay for your holiday. I mean, interestingly, short-term mission trips often are self-funded. Yeah. You, know, you used to say to the youngsters in church, you've got to raise your own money. Yeah. Go and do a sponsored car wash, whatever you do these days. Mm -hmm. But do you think actually it's a better principle for churches to be funding short-term mission trips if they're really important? You know, if, if they want to raise money another way and give it to the church, great. Yeah. But actually the church could have greater ownership of it, couldn't it, by funding short-term yeah, mission yeah. trips? Again, I think if the church is taking a lead in this and thinks, right, you know, we are supporting a couple in um, at the Canary Islands, I don't know, wherever, and we want, you know... Sounds like my kind of mission work. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I was thinking that's, that's, that's very idealistic. Let, let's, let, let's change that. And we're supporting a couple in Burkina Faso. Okay, much better. Um, yep. out, which is a country I love. Um, and we've got some, you know, we've got a group of teenagers who are sort of all of an age where they could go. We want to encourage them in their discipleship to learn from this couple. Perhaps the, the couple needs some support in some area. We can send them out for a month. Let's do that. And it'd be a church project. Now, perhaps you might ask the kids to, to raise something towards it, but to see it as a church project rather than the typical thing where somebody goes to a conference or they see something on the internet and say, Pastor, I, I feel a call to short-term mission. I want to go yeah, here. Yeah. I think sending people rather than reacting yeah. is really important. Like it. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the things I would say... Um, again, in you know, looking at mission agencies, is um, if, if, if when a mission agency tweets, uh, if you're interested in short-term mission, talk to us. Don't work with them. If they tweet, if you're interested in short-term min mission, talk to your pastor, then talk to us, okay. then talk to them. Yeah. Which comes back to the ecclesiology, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, which, of course, fits very naturally with us as a movement. We're trying to always be thinking about how our ecclesiology is worked out in yeah. practice. But actually, I think the, the reality is when it comes to mission, we, we're perhaps a little bit more compromised than we are in other areas. Perhaps, perhaps because of history, perhaps because of guilt. I don't know what it might yeah, be. I think yeah, history and tradition. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, you can go back to Carey and his um, encouraging to go out and reach people and then the response, well, if God's going to reach the heathen, heathen he'll do so without your help or mine, young man. Or a short-term mission trip, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we, we go right back to the, this history of churches saying we don't need to do it and yeah, you've got yeah. the mission agency saying, yes, yeah. we do. Um, and I, I think churches have backed off and let mission agencies do their job. Yeah. And churches need to step up. And that actually will, you know, there is likely to be a bit of a friction as that happens. I think one thing that is interesting looking at the scene in the UK now is the way that groups like New Frontiers are effectively operating as their own mission sending agencies. Oh, yeah. Now, they will work with groups like Wycliffe and others um, at times, but they actually function as a sending agency themselves. Yeah. And I think, you know, in a sense, that's a much better model. Yeah, yeah. Um, could we talk about some particular types of agencies. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing some of these you might have some strong opinions on. I don't know. We'll see. Um, I'm thinking in particular um, of um, kind of relief agencies. Yeah. Um, and those that provide support after, you know, a tsunami or a, a natural disaster or whatever it may be. Um, and also, um, perhaps this is a, it might be the same category, but it might also be a separate category. Um, what I call, I don't, I don't know, maybe I don't really have a term for it, agencies that essentially collect money and then pass it on to third parties that you're one step removed from. Yeah. That might actually be how the disaster agencies often yeah, work. Yeah. But, it, but it might be a bit more 
Christian frontline work. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're interested in if you're interested in ministry in Thailand, give us money, and then yeah. we su we support various yeah. organisations in Thailand. That, that that feels always to me like it's one step removed. Um, so, just do you want to say a little bit about those? Uh, I guess they're two different groups at, at one level. Yeah, I um, I I believe in holistic mission. I think um, you know Jesus' great command great commandment to um, look after people, care for them is as valid as the Great Commission. Yeah. Um, I don't put capital letters behind either of them. Um, but mission needs to be holistic. And I think where we are doing social relief, creation care, lots of different things, it has to fit within a free framework where there is disciple-making, gospel proclamation, right. you know, church okay. work or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, so... If there is a, a tsunami, if there is a national natural disaster, then I think it is right that Christians step up and give money. I think, you know, that is right and proper. Well it's two Corinthians eight nine, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Essentially. It's it's like collecting for the for, yeah. for the poor in Jerusalem. Yeah. But long term mission commitment I think should go hand in hand with some sort of disciple making. Um so um, you know, it's not a, a, a comment on any particular agency, but I think we need to think in terms of holistic work where proclamation, making disciples, teaching the scriptures are sitting alongside yeah, yeah. relief, poverty, hospitals. You know, um, sometimes the social activity can be the, the thing that opens the doors to the gospel work. Sometimes it can be a natural outflow, you know, how, how they happen. But if you have a personal relationship with a, an agency or a church yeah. or an individual, you know that sort of information. Yes. So Missionary Hospital in the north of Madagascar, yep. you know what they're trying to do. You know how they're trying yep. to connect that in mm -hmm. with gospel proclamation. And so actually you can give to the work of the hospital with a, with a good conscience, knowing exactly yep. how their strategy informs what you're doing. Yeah, and that hospital is also doing some Bible translation. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. We're talking about the same place. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I think the sort of grant making charities, you know, that's um, the term I was searching yeah. for and failing dismally to, to find. I, I think where they encourage a church to make direct links with people, that's great. Yeah, you know, um, I, I, I would give uh, you know the example of Wycliffe because it, it's one I know. Um, other other groups do the same. We tend to encourage people to support a particular project and to get to know and be aware of those people. It's not just give you money and, you know, we'll deal with it. Mm -hmm. It's make a connection, make a commitment to people. And, you know, when that goes really well, the commitment will may well last longer than with yeah, involvement. Yeah. And um, the, the West know, is... I, I, do, I, I do struggle with the idea, just give you money and go away. Yeah, yeah. Um, it does sound as though it's yeah. sort of a conscience solver, doesn't it? I, we are so rich materially, aren't we, that if you have a missionary connection with someone in the Ivory Coast, yeah, um, and if you were to phone them up and say, you know, we want to give to to help those who are less fortunate than mm -hmm. ourselves, you're going to have you're going to have connections already, aren't you? Yes, yeah. doing that kind of work. Yeah, you don't need to go somewhere else, do you? I guess if there's a specific response. Yeah, I, I think it helps to have people on the ground who can help, you know, yeah. who are thinking through how can we give this money and not kill local okay. initiatives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are too many examples of, you know, Christian and secular charities um, squashing local initiative completely by giving money in a way that in the end is not helpful. You know, local Christians need to learn to be generous. They need to learn to give. But if churches and church leaders are being paid by the West, why do local ch Christians ever need to learn to tithe? Right, um, right. So that sort of thing has to be thought through. And having somebody on the ground who is helping to think that through, who is helping to make the relationship so it can happen, can be very, very which, useful. Which comes back to a real vibrant living relationship between a church and those it's supporting is yeah. absolutely key, isn't it? And so so the agency actually is there to enable the relationship. That would be one way of describing yes, yeah, the agency's yeah. role. And, you know, and, and as that relationship develops, the agency may step back. But somebody to help, you know, 
make that connection yeah. is yeah. really important. And it might be a, yeah. it might be an expat agency, it might be a local Christian that you know, mm. but somebody to help. Um, you know, it is easy. It is so easy from the West to do more harm than good by throwing money at things. Mm. It doesn't always help. So it's the knowledge again, isn't it? Yeah. It's the understanding that helps people to mm -hmm. make wise decisions, yeah. essentially. Great. Well, um, all complaints <laughs> to be sent to this address. Uh, thanks, Eddie, so much for joining us. Stimulating as ever and um, really helpful stuff. And I, I just think I'm struck, at, just struck again, actually, by how key real personal relationships are to the whole of Christian ministry, actually, whether it's in, in the UK, partnership between churches, whether it's mission, Actually, it's that relational element, isn't it, which is the kind of the, yeah. the lifeblood, really, of, of partnership. I, I think a church who's thinking about mission partnerships would do really well to look at Philippians, because in some ways, that's a prayer letter. It's Paul, a missionary. You know, it, it's um, anachronistic to call Paul a missionary, Indeed. but effectively. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But he's writing to a church that sent him financial support and saying thank you for it. Yeah. He actually yeah. says, and... You know, I depend on God and not on you, but but thank you anyway. But the depth of the relationship which flows through Philippians, it is just yeah. so key. Yeah. And I think that is a model that we need to be thinking yes. about. And actually, if you read Philippians in that light, it becomes a very moving it, oh, it letter, is, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes, it's not just a yeah. kind of a doctrinal, um, you know, diatribe. It actually becomes a very moving partnership yes. and, experience. And I, and I think yeah. that is its first purpose. Yes. You know, yeah. with our Western rationalistic hats on, we look at it as a theological document. Yeah. It's a letter between friends. Yeah. Great. Well, that's a great place to end. Eddie, thanks so much for joining us. It's always great to have you here and uh, bless you in your work. And uh, thank you for joining us today on Independence. And if you've liked the podcast, do remember you can subscribe through your normal channels. Look forward to catching up with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.